Well, hey there. My name is Ben from Circle Canoe Games, and welcome to another Finish This Game video. In this video, we're going to be talking through Game 3 in the Finish This Game project series, where I give you the skeleton of a game, and you get to practice actually finishing games so you can level up your game design skills. In this video, we're going to talk through the components, mechanics. I'm actually going to do a little playthrough so you can see how this game works. And then we'll discuss a few ideas on how you can start taking this idea and making it your own. Of course, there's the source files you can access so you can instantly go in and start editing and making changes to this core game I'm giving you. But before we jump in on game three, I want to talk about the bigger idea of what am I doing with finish this game. Uh, I've been trying to design games for about 10 years now, but for the first few years, I really struggled. I, I would come up with ideas, I would get pretty far in the design process, but I could just never seem to pull it together into a finished game. And after years of struggling with that, I realized game design is a skill just like anything else, and it needs to be developed over time. I need to have smaller wins to build my skills and eventually graduate up to larger projects, larger games that I can complete. But before I can do the larger games, I need to make some smaller, simpler games to see what it really takes to finish a game. So these Finish This Game projects are meant to give you a really easy jumping off point to quickly make a game your own and bring it to a point where you'd say it is finished. Each project includes a working skeleton of a game. There's rules, mechanics, components. Uh, you can download a free print and play version of the game. You can have access to the source files so you can instantly go and start making changes to the, the digital files themselves so you can make this game your own. And so really, Finish This Game is all about giving you practice as a game designer, helping you to level up your skills. So this is not about getting published. This is not about trying to get to a Kickstarter as soon as possible on your, your uh, holy grail game idea that you have. This is about helping you level up your skills. And with all that said, you might have the question, well then, if it's not about getting a published game, what is a finished game? What am I talking about? Well, to me, a finished game is a game that is fun, is playable by anyone without you having to be there, and the prototype has reached a level of polish that it helps the game, okay? This is not something where this is shelf ready. This is something where you can make copies and hand them out to friends and family, and they can enjoy this game with you. Okay, that would be finished. So we're not talking about published, we're not talking about uh, custom artwork or any of that, because to me, those are all huge barriers to people actually finishing. They feel like, well, if the artwork isn't gonna be good enough, or if I'm gonna have to invest a lot of money into getting the artwork that I can picture, uh, it's just not worth the effort, or I'm not, it's gonna take years and years to get that done, or to be able to have enough money to do that even. So this is a way that we can have a finished game. And then if you want to take it to the next level with awesome art or with trying to pitch it or do a Kickstarter, well, that's great. But that's not the focus of what I'm doing here. Here, we're all about just helping you get to that level of practicing finishing a game for yourself. All right. I think that's pretty clear for this background stuff of why are we doing this? What are we hoping to accomplish? Now let's go ahead and jump into game three of this Finish This Game project series. First thing I want to talk about is what is this game about, right? What is, how would I define it? At its core, game three is a set collection and sequencing card game, but it has an added mechanic of balancing that really kind of sets it apart and makes it interesting to play with. And what I mean by balancing is that you're going to essentially have two columns of numbers and items, and they need to be roughly equal to each other. Uh, and you'll see how that's working as we go through the game. So that's it. It's really simple. You're just trying to get the most valuable sets and collections, but there's this limiting factor, essentially, that is telling you you have to sequence things in a certain way. You have to collect them in a certain way. Uh, and that's the balancing aspect. So once we get into the gameplay, I think it'll make a lot of sense to you. But before we get to gameplay, let's look at the components. And this is another good thing for you. The components are dead simple. There are 36 micro cards. Uh, and I chose micro cards because you're going to end up having a bunch in front of you. Uh, and so I didn't want them to take up too much table space. Uh, and so we have a series of colors and shapes and numbers on these uh, cards. There's 36 of them, which fits nicely on a single 
letter sized piece of paper so you can print this out just on one sheet and cut it out in you know two minutes and you are ready to play uh, this game. Of course there's also rules that I have written up so you can jump right into this skeleton of a game and start playing and after that then you can start thinking how would you make this your own. So there's the big idea of what this game is about, what are we playing with, now let's go ahead and look at what a game will look like. Okay, so this is the setup for the start of game three. And I, I skipped over uh, the first few steps that are described in the rules uh, that each player gets six cards and they pick three in order to make their first scales. So let me introduce you to what's going on here. So we have uh, player one, player two, player three, and we have this central draw area where essentially players will be drafting cards from. There's the draw pile that these cards will get replaced from throughout the game. Uh, and then each one of these, for lack of a better word, represents each player's scale. And you can see each one is made up of uh, either one or two cards to start with. But each one balances with, with each other. And so let's define balance because that is a central concept for this idea. Uh, and so balance just means when you add up the numbers in each of the columns that they are roughly equal to each other and precisely they need to be within plus or minus one of each other. So for example, this one has two and two, so that makes this column four and this one is three. So those are within one of each other, so that's fine. Over here, these are exactly equal, which is fine, right? This column is three, this column is three, this one, this column is four, this column is four. So the term balance is going to come up in this game a lot, and that's what we mean. It's plus or minus one. Once each player gets their initial three cards set up and they're balanced, then everyone is going to rotate. So what we mean by rotate is that you're going to take the top card from the one column and move it over to the other, and the bottom card from the other column and move it over. So you can see what has happened now is what had been nicely balanced is suddenly now not balanced. And there's the central tension of the game. Uh, you're going to need to be playing cards in order to restore balance to your scale, to your, your two columns of cards. Uh, and at the same time, it's going to matter what cards are next to each other and for scoring and things like that. Uh, so let me go ahead and rotate these ones. This comes there, that goes there. And this one goes there, this one goes there. Okay, so now we're set up to actually begin play, uh, and I'll play this player first. Um, so at the start of your turn, you're going to first add, which means you're going to pick one of the face-up cards here, and you're going to add it to your scale. The rules for adding are you're able to add it to the top or the bottom of either column, but you can't add it into the middle. And when you add it, you need to achieve balance, so you can't I couldn't, for instance, just take this four because I want four, which will be more points at the end, and add it over here because that is not balanced, right? We have uh, nine over here and only two there. So I need to add something to this side that will give me balance. Right now I have five and two. So if I wanted to, I could go ahead and add a four over to this side. And once again, I could add it to the bottom I could add it to the top. And the reason that matters is because once I rotate, uh, that will pretty drastically change the outcome for my next round if that will be balanced. Uh, in this case, I'm going to go ahead and add it here. And once I have balance, then I rotate. Okay, so you add and then rotate. That's your turn. Go ahead and rotate. There. We replace that card, and then the next player would go. Now, that begs a pretty obvious question, which is, is that it? Well, no, there's more. There's another layer to this. So we're using these numbers in order to get the balancing number, right? We're just adding them up. But in terms of scoring, there are points involved for each one of these items, and there's also bonuses or penalties for things being next to each other that shouldn't be, or bonuses for having a sequence of things. And so let me just show you that real quick, and I'll read through what those are. 
first there's the pink circle, you get minus one point for each one you have in your scale, unless you have three of them, in which case they're two points each. The purple oval, you get one point for each, again, unless you have three, and then there are three points each. So these are low value unless you get a set. Uh, the dark blue triangles, uh, these are plus two for every pair next to each other. So you're trying to get two next to each other to get some bonus points. The light blue square is three points each, but you get minus one point for every dark blue it's next to. The dark blue pentagon is worth three points and there's no penalty or anything associated with it, but you do have to be careful, again, that there's no light blue square next to it uh, if you don't want to lose some points. Next, there's the yellow hexagon. That is worth three points at the end of the game. And likewise, uh, the yellow small star is worth four points at the end of the game. You can see they're both yellow because there is a yellow item bonus. So you get uh, equal to, you get a bonus equal to the number of yellow items you have in a row. So if you get three yellow items in a row, you get a bonus of three points at the end. Next, we have the orange cross which is worth four points, which is quite a lot, but you get minus three points for every small or large star that it's next to. And last, we have the red large star, and that is worth five points. Finally, it's minus two points for every dropped item. A dropped item occurs throughout the game if in order to achieve balance, rather than playing a card, you actually need to remove an item from your scale. Uh, so those will be minus points at the end. So. That's the rationale behind why would I choose uh, one kind of three versus another, or why would I choose to have an exact balance uh, so things are perfectly equal instead of close balance of plus or minus one. Uh, so you have to be playing what you're allowed to do or setting yourself up so that you're able to play the cards that you want. Of course, other players are choosing from the same list of cards, so there's no guarantee that the cards you want are going to be available on your next turn. You definitely have to be a little bit op opportunistic in order to, uh, you know, make use of what is available. So let me play through a little bit, and then we will talk about a few more rules. Okay, so we're back to this player's second turn, and you'll notice that right now they actually have balance. This column is five and this column is six. There's their plus or minus one without playing anything. So they have a few options. They could still, of course, choose to draw a card and play it, but they could also choose to replace an item from anyone's scale, including their own, with a card from here. Uh, the reason that could be beneficial is one, to take away from someone else's uh, bonus points or something like that, or if you have a card that's hurting you. For instance, if you have the orange cross next to a couple stars, that suddenly is giving you minus points at the end of the game, you could swap that out, and that could potentially, you know, boost your score at the end. But the drawback is, of course, you're not adding more items to your scale, and having more items tends to give you a higher score at the end. If a player has exact balance at the start of their turn, meaning that both columns are exactly equal to each other, then they have three options of what they can do, but they can only choose one. They are able to draw from the cards in the center and add that to their scale, just like a normal turn. They are able to discard an item from an opponent's scale. So they can basically attack an opponent and take any card out of their opponent's scale. Or they can choose to take a dropped item that they've had to drop on a previous turn and re-add it to their scale without needing to achieve balance. Rather than getting that minus two penalty at the end of the game, they're able to add it back and give them points once again. And last, there's one more rule that would help you understand a bit of strategy with how you're playing your items in your scale, and that's exemplified over on this player. You can see I have a pair of two identical items in the same column. For every pair you have like that, you get to broaden the range that you're able to achieve balance over by one. So that means since they have one pair, instead of needing to achieve balance with plus or minus one, they can achieve balance with plus or minus two. So in this case, they have a six and a three. So they could play a one on this side 
and that would bring it up to a four, but that would be close enough because now they're doing a plus or minus two range. Or if they were able to play a five, they could because that would bring this up to eight and that to six and that's still plus or minus two. But as soon as the next round happens and they rotate, suddenly these cards are not next to each other in the same column and so that bonus would go away. But then if there's another following turn and those go back next to each other exactly, then they would get that balance back. So getting the same card next to each other gives you kind of an ongoing, but not every turn, benefit as you play the game. Okay, so I'm gonna play through this and get to the end of the game where we'll talk about final scoring. So now we're nearing the end of the game. So the end game conditions are when a player has played 10 items in their scale, they finish their turn, every other player gets one turn, and the game is done. The only change that's different is that once a player has taken their last turn, no one else can mess with their scale, right? No one else can play it or, or uh, take away items or anything like that. Uh, so the game for this player is done. The other players take a turn as normal. So just a quick example, I was able to play this five here because this side is 16, this side is 14, but since they have one, two, three pairs, it's actually plus or minus four that they can have balance in. So if they're going to take that one, then they would rotate. Now that player's done. All players have taken their final turn, and now the game moves to scoring. Okay, so the best way to go about scoring is to move through these one player at a time, one item at a time. So the first one we're going to talk about is the pink circle. This player does not have any pink circles. Uh, next would be the purple oval, and this player does have one uh, and he doesn't get the bonus because you would have to have three to have the bonus. So uh, let me first say player one, and they just get one point for that. Next would be the dark blue triangles. They're two points apiece, but plus two for each pair. Uh, and this actually brings up an important point. For the purposes of the game, these columns are viewed as separate. So you can't have a pair that's split across this. But for the purposes of final scoring, this is viewed as a contiguous circle. So if you have, for instance, over here, these two uh, pentagons next to each other, those are counted as being next to each other. Uh, whereas during the game, you would not get the pair bonus from those when they're in that specific position because they are split in different columns. So back to scoring player one. Uh, they have... Uh, one, two, three, four of these dark blue triangles, so that would be eight points. And then they also get two bonuses for having two pairs, uh, so of plus two for each bonus. So that is equal to a total of 12 points for those. Uh, next, uh, light blue squares, uh, that is just worth three points, but minus one for each dark blue and it is next to one dark blue, so that is just two points. Uh, the dark blue pentagon is just worth three points. There's no bonuses or anything else, so he has two of those. That's worth six. Next, uh, yellow hexagon. He does not have yellow small star. He does not have the orange cross. He has two orange crosses, and they are not next to stars, so that just means he has eight points for those, and then finally uh, a large star doesn't have, and a dropped item does not have that either. So we total these up, that's 20, 29. Okay, so player one gets 29 
points. Hopefully my math check out, checks out. Okay. Player two. That's going to be right over here. Uh, and so once again, we're going to go through those sequence of things. So we have a pink circle that is minus one. A purple oval that is one. A dark blue triangle they don't have. A light blue square. They have two of those. Um, and they are not next to blue, so that means that's three points each. That's six. They have um, next a dark blue pentagon. They have two of those. There's no bonuses with that, so that is six more. Uh, they don't have any uh, yellow hexagon. They don't have any yellow star. They don't have any uh, orange cross. They have four uh, of the large stars, so that's worth 20. Okay, and so we add that up. That's uh, 20, 32, 33 minus 1, so 32. Once again, I hope my math checks out for that. And last we have player three. Again, we start from the beginning. We have two of the pink circles, so that's minus two. Uh, we have two of the purple ovals, so that is worth two. We have uh, no dark blue triangles. We have one light blue square which that is not next to any dark blue, so that's worth three. Um, dark blue pentagon, we do not have a hex, yellow hexagon, we have two of those, so that's worth uh, six. We have two yellow small stars, so that's worth eight. Then they have a yellow item bonus of four items in a row, so that's an additional four points. Uh, and then they do not have, or they do have, sorry, they have one orange cross, and that's not next to a star, so that is worth four. And they do not have any large stars, nor do they have dropped items. So we add that up. They have eight, 16, 22, 27 minus two is 25, I believe. Okay, and so there you have it, these three players ended up with a score of 29, 32, and 25. We have player two over here is the winner. They were able to collect a lot of those high value fives, um, and so they are the winner. Okay, so now you've seen how this game plays. You've gotten a sense of the rules, the scoring, how, uh, how all this works. And so now you have a couple tasks. One is go ahead and download the print and play file. Again, this is a single page cutout uh, so it's going to be ready really easy. You can download the rules with that. And if you want, you can go ahead and even access the uh, the source files so that you'll be able to make changes to the digital files. I have those files available in two formats. There's InDesign, which is what I normally design in, but I also have a version in Google Slides. And those Google Slides files would be usable in uh, PowerPoint, in Google Slides, or in uh, Keynote if those are your pieces of software of choice. Um, those are pretty accessible for someone who's not used to dealing with design software at all. And so where do you go from here? Well, what I would recommend is playing a few games uh, of this stock skeleton game, right? Try it out to see what's going on. But I think this game, even more so than the other uh, finish this game projects we've been doing, would really benefit from theme because it's very abstract as it is. And the reason I've done that is to leave it completely open so you can theme it how you want. But it's harder to remember that, you know, a light blue square is minus points when it's next to dark blue squares instead of starting to make some thematic connections that there's things that shouldn't be next to each other and you lose points if they are. So I think this for this particular project, one of your first goals is to start thinking for you, is there a theme that works? Uh, I know that for myself, I've been working on this game some more and trying to finish it myself. And there's a theme that stuck out to me right away. 
uh, as far as what I think would make this a fun game and kind of a quirky experience as well. Uh, and so in a future video, I'm going to talk about uh, all the brainstorming ideas I have, talk about the theme, mechanics, rules, and score conditions, just as a way of saying these are some options. And there's certainly not all the options, but if I were to sit down and kind of write out all the directions I could go, that's what I would come up with. And so that will be in a future video. Um, and then even with this project, I think I'm going to make a separate video that's talking about how I'm choosing to finish this game. And I'll show you where I'm at in the design process and the choices I've made so far. So that's all I have for this video. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in and following along. I really do want to see your work. Of course, you can leave any ideas or comments below. Uh, but really, the best way to reach out is to find me on Instagram or Facebook. You can find me at Circle Canoe. And of course, please subscribe. Uh, that really helps me make more content like this to be building this community of people who are game makers, people that enjoy the process of making games that want to up their skills and have fun in the process. Really looking forward to what you make. I'll see you in the next video.